Tonight, what I'll be teaching you is two movements that have caused so much hurt in churches, all right? This is the evangelical movement that the Lord has used, the body of Christ of believers that the Lord has used. I'm not talking about false religions out there. I'm talking about this is the right kind of movement that the Lord used, but there are two movements that have hurt it, the Bible believers throughout history that the Lord has used. All right, so let me first establish the fact with Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. My recommendation is to watch the video, Two Worst Doctrines Ever for Christians. Two Worst Doctrines Ever for Christians. And I, put, and I told you about these two movements a long time ago, and now I'm seeing it on YouTube, so it's not a surprise to me. But this is seeping among churches, too, that I'm seeing. All right, the two worst movements. Before I mention who they are, let's establish Acts chapter 11. Notice that the Bible says in verse 26, And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. So this is where right doctrine is being taught. And the disciples were called what? Christians first in Antioch. That's where right doctrine was first was right Christian, the word Christian came out, the, the right Christian doctrine was established here. Notice also that if you look at verse, uh, let's see right here, 21, the hand of the Lord was moving around here. Look at verse 19, the word of the Lord was being preached. Look at verse 23 through 24. They were preaching the word of the Lord. That's where the word of God was preached, Antioch. Now, this is the beginning of our church history with Christian. Now, early church history cannot deny the fact that in early church history right here, that Antioch, biblically speaking, was first called Christians. And they had a literal approach. That is very important to understand. Amen. They believed every word of God was perfect. Mm -hmm. Now, I taught you this in another video as well, so I'm not going to go too much into this. But this is where we establish the fact why the King James Bible, King James only, is very important. You might say, why is that? Because... The idea of believing every word of God is perfect hangs in the balance. If you don't believe every word of God is perfect, my question to you is this. Then what is your final authority right. of the Bible being every word perfect? That's right. You cannot have this approach unless you have a perfect word of God. And when we look at manuscript evidence and all that, it's the King James Bible. For those of you who don't know about this issue, my recommendation is to watch Intermediate Discipleship 1 and 2. And that covers the whole King James Bible issue. This also proves the dispensationalism approach. What is dispensationalism? It is the approach of the historical grammatical approach where we believe every word of God is perfect. So if there's a verse that teaches, let's say for an example, Old Testament salvation, they had to go by the works of the law. So because that is different from Paul's teaching, where he said we go by faith only, not by the works of the law, the simple answer is this, dispensationalism is rightly dividing the verses to the right group of people and the right time period. So the works of the law for salvation is Old Testament, and that's divided, those verses are divided separately from Paul's verses, which are for Christians in the church. Christians in the church are not the same as the Jews of the Old Testament. That's where a lot of false doctrine come from, is combining Israel with the church together. This teaching of Israel and the church is where they have a spiritual or metaphorical approach. What does that mean? With the verses, they don't literally take every word as it says. They spiritualize verses. That's why you keep hearing about people saying, we Christians are the real Jews. We are the real Jews. See, what they're trying to say is we're the real spiritual Jews. That's what they're trying to say. 
not flesh and blood Jews. They deny that such a flesh and blood Jew exists. But God says, no, literally, literal Jews exist. Spiritual Jews, they do not replace the literal Jews, you've got to understand. God has a separate program for spiritual Christians and literal physical Jews. That's what we believe in. They are not the same. But the spiritual metaphorical approach equates these two together. That's why when you cannot divide verses. So verses that applies to Jews, they apply that to the Christian doctrine. That is important to understand. This spiritual metaphorical approach is not in Antioch. This is located in Alexandria, Egypt. They have a spiritual metaphorical approach. Here's another thing. Antioch consisted of preachers. Alexandria consisted of scholars. You'll notice this is undeniable in early church history. In fact, early church fathers from Alexandria, Egypt, all they did was study, study, study. Now, is it good to study the Bible? Yes. But if all you do is sit at home and study, study, study the Bible, what's going to happen is this. Then you have a prideful approach, and then you're going to take verses, and you want to teach them the way you want to do it. What we do is that when we study the Bible, we study the Bible, and we go out and win souls. Amen. That's what we do. We minister to people. That's what the, uh, the Syrians did, Antioch, Syria. Nestorians who came from Antioch, Syria, in fact, they were so evangelical that they reached as far as to China and maybe Korea. That's very possible, actually. There are traditional sources that said maybe up to Japan, but we don't know about that. But see, that's Antioch. Alexandria, study, study, study. So they became bookish. Now, remember that. Remember that. That's where all your liberal modernism teaching comes from as well. They praise the wisdom of the Egyptians, philosophy. Remember that. Okay. Augustine was one of them. And he gave birth to this wicked doctrine of Israel and the church being the same, which is called replacement theology. It is also known as replacement theology. That is anti-dispensationalism. He also gave birth to a hellish doctrine called Calvinism. Calvinism. So here, are, here is one of the two worst movements. Calvinism is one of them. That has been the detrimental effect to the right Christian movement. Remember that. Okay? Because what happened is that this kind of teaching seeped in. But... What came out is the Catholic Church, obviously, right? There was no such thing as Calvinism that time. It was the Catholic Church. So then, while the Catholic Church had their own movement going on right here, the early Christians had their own movement. During their own movement, we cannot deny that some of the people like Augustine and other church fathers had an influence on this right movement. Remember that. That's going to be salient. So then you had the old-time Waldensians. I don't know if I spelled that right, but the Vaudois. By the way, Alexandria, Egypt gave birth to your modern Bibles today. The KJV came from a line of manuscripts in Antioch, Syria. That's where the King James Bible came from. NIV, ESV... They, and the famous modern Bible translations came from Alexandria. See, this has been the thorn on the side. These are the two movements. But let's see how this worked. So now you got the right movement from Christians. See, you got a wrong movement here, Catholic Church, and then the right movement. As the right movement continued with Waldensians, Luther broke the chains of the Catholic Church. So what happened right here is that now Catholics started to leave. And they started to join the right movement. But this Calvinist doctrine corrupted this right movement throughout history. Luther, unfortunately, was infected by some of Calvin's doctrine. So here's the thing. Why did Luther, why was Luther right about salvation? Because he had the approach of taking the word of God as it says, as the final authority. That was the issue. That's Antioch, Syria right there. 
not scholars as the final authority, but the word of God. So Luther, why wasn't he like us today with the King James only dispensational approach? Because you got hunt centuries and centuries of this garbage of Catholic doctrine. So some people start to break forth into light, see? But then Calvin, he revived some of the stupid doctrine from Augustine, and Luther, unfortunately, fell trapped into this. So then, the let's put purple here. That way we can see the wrong people here. So unfortunately, Luther was half and half, let's say. Because what, what, what do we commend him on? Concerning about salvation by faith alone, not by works. That's what we can commend him on from breaking that with the literal approach. Everything else, you're going to find a lot of problems with Luther. Because this doctrine, see, was so prevalent in the Catholic Church, Luther was infested with some of that as well. Calvin revives Augustine's teaching, which is why I do not like Calvin. And that's where the, we, the famous term Calvinism came from him. Why? Because he's the famous person that revived it. But he's not the one that started it. It's right here with Augustine, where these people, these people in the Alexandrian section. Erasmus was the one responsible for producing our King James Bible text. This guy hated Calvinism. He hated Calvinism. The Pope mentioned, uh, not the Pope, but I, there's a saying that I think that Erasmus laid the egg and Luther hatched it against the Catholic Church. See, that is very true. Luther, I mean, Erasmus, he laid the biblical text, and then Luther, he broke the chains of the Catholic Church with salvation by faith alone. So that's why I commend these two people. Erasmus, he hated Calvinism. Now, what happened was when the Catholic Church lost their power, then they went through where the conspiracies and the elites came to the scene that time. Conspiracies came out, and that's when the cults like Mormonism, Jehovah Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists gave birth. So this went out public, this went underground, because the Vatican lost their power. Once the King James Bible was published, that laid boom to the birth of America, and because of the freedom of American government that the Lord laid out, the Great Awakening revivals bursted forth. But this is not to say that this was not infected either. Uh, as you know, the birth of our government, yes, on godly principles, but it cannot, expect, it cannot escape the corruption of some of the elites, unfortunately, including the preaching. The Great Awakening preachings could not escape the corruption from Calvinism. So then Jonathan Edwards, unfortunately, had a lot of Calvinism doctrines. David Brainerd, when you read his diary, you get depressed. It's got a lot of good things, but you got to realize this, it's so depressing. And that's why when you read a lot of these Puritan writers, a lot of it during devotional, spiritual, uh, higher up for God, which is great, but because they keep uh, putting themselves down, 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 and sovereignty of God, sovereignty of God, it, it's so miserable when you read their lives. They can't enjoy life. That's what you read. See, we Christians believe in free will, right? So you got to do something yourself. See, so if you're miserable with your life, there's something wrong with you. You can't just blame God. You can't expect God to dump you a handout all the time. So you got to do something yourself, man. Look, if you're not enjoying life, that's your problem. You're not using your free will to plan things out well where you can enjoy things in your life. Okay, but Calvinism infected the Great Awakening revivals. George Whitfield, famous preacher whose voice boomed for over a mile long, Calvinist in his thinking. That's why him and John Wesley also had differences with each other. John Wesley hated, and his brother, John and Charles Wesley, hated Calvinism to a T. Charles Wesley went, he's famous for writing hymns and poems, and he wrote this one poem or hymn that like just charged against Calvinism. So they hated that. So Calvinist teachings. So Calvinism infected the Great Awakening revivals. Now what happened was, is that, now, these two issues started to pop out more. They started to realize that once modernism seeped in. So now these elites who dug underground all that time finally gave birth to modernism. So here we are at the time of modernism. 
So what happened? Now it's going like this. See? Not going here. Now people are leaving to here. So the elites took over and modernism have influenced the churches. The ones who tried to attack this modernism movement were based off of three keys here. It was that these two approaches were revived. And these were revived by the Independent Fundamental Baptist Movement, otherwise known as IFB. This is why we go by this movement. Now, remember this. IFB, they got problems, all right? And you can find problems. Trust me, even if you're in the right church movement, you're going to find at least, at the very least, one church, one pastor who's corrupt somewhere. Sorry. So that's undoubtable. But anyway, within the IFB movement, why do we go by this movement? Because they're the best with these two approaches. That's why. This is why we go by them. The IFB was born attacking modernism to begin with. That's how it started. So they established the fact concerning fundamentals. Through that, then what happened is one by one by one, they start to get more and more into this approach. And then the ones who revived the KJV only movement and dispensational approaches would fail to include. So Schofield popularized it. That's how the Lord used him for the dispensational approach. The King James only approach was popularized by Ruckman. And then the IFB breaking off from the, uh, from the denomination movement to be independent was J. Frank Norris. These were three people who popularized the three movement. Ruckman was better because he combined all three together. So that's where our history came from. Calvinism was the enemy camp of the dispensational approach. Because like Calvin, all they did was sit at home like scholars. And what they hated about the dispensational approach is that they denied this teaching that Israel was different from the church. So then, uh, Calvinism, they also teach the idea that the church will go through the tribulation. That's what the Catholic Church teaches. So then the dispensational approach teaches, no, the church will not go through the tri tribulation. That's Israel's program. The church will be raptured before the tribulation. The Calvinist approach, they also had a heretical doctrine, so then we see all these heretical doctrines. We see replacement theology from Calvinism. We also see the church going through the tribulation. That's Calvinism. And we see the approach concerning about covenant of grace. That's Calvinism. What is covenant of grace? Covenant of grace teaches that Old Testament and all time periods had the same salvation like us Christians today. No, that's ridiculous. In the tribulation, obviously the salvation is different. You have to not deny Jesus Christ and avoid the mark of the beast. That's a lot of work. In the Old Testament, you had to go by the Mosaic law. That's why they had to observe Sabbath, do all these works. The Christian church, we don't observe the Sabbath or the Mosaic law. Why did Paul denounce them? Because our salvation is faith alone in Jesus Christ, not by works. See, that's dividing salvations. Covenant of grace came from Calvinism as well. Calvinism gave birth to all of this. Lordship salvation is another heretical doctrine from Calvinism. Why is this doctrine important to Calvinists? Because there are verses that they don't divide salvation. Yeah. So because they don't divide ver uh, the salvation verses, they're trying to think, how do we reconcile works passages with faith alone? Because Luther did the literal approach, salvation by faith alone, not by works. Boom. So then how you can reconcile the two is, we are, if you're truly saved by faith alone, you will show the works. That is a Calvinist teaching. No, faith alone is just that, just believing on Christ for salvation. No work involved. So, this was a Calvinist teaching as well. They infected it. So, this Calvinism teaching ha has infected the dispensational literal camp approach. This is where we Bible believers come in. See that? So then the Bible believers came in, influenced by the IFB people and what makes a gen genuine Bible believer literally taking every word as it says the closer you are to this and to this 
the more close you are to this. Unfortunately, there are, this is the devil's tool. Now we've got the Bible believers who were influenced by the IFB, see that? With these two approaches. But now what happened is that now you got Bible believers and IFB going here. See that? And then going here. And there's a small fringe because they're just so weird. But there's a small fringe even that falls into replacement theology and that the church will go through the tribulation. They teach that if you're truly saved by faith alone, your works will show. And there are Bible believers and independent fundamental Baptists who fall into this heresy. They fall into the heresy of covenant of grace, that salvation by grace was the same in the Old Testament, just like us Christians today in the New Testament. But that's hilarious. No. That's why it's called Old Testament, New Testament. Duh, there's a division there for a reason. But you see that? Look at this apostasy going with the right movement here. While modernism and the Catholic Church and the conspiracy elites are rising over here, these guys are falling into these false doctrines. Now, let me show you another thing right here. Is that now there's a second movement, which now I'm going to mention. What happens is now that people are aiming toward here, the devil realizes, well, if I can't get them sucked with the Calvinism movement that time, let me abuse these. So what he now had, this is the next heresy. These are the two worst movements ever that will be detrimental to the right movement of Christianity. And I don't want people watching us online confuse us with these two movements. These are the mid-acts. I'm telling you, there are Bible believers who are falling into this false teaching mid-Acts. What is mid-Acts? They hyper-divide. They don't rightly divide verses. How do they do that, Pastor? Because they know that Paul, he taught about salvation by faith, not by works, right? To the Christian church. Isn't that correct? So they automatically assume only those 13 epistles, or excuse me, the 12 epistles by Paul, those 12 epistles by Paul apply to us Christians. So all the other books, in, all the other books, rest of the 66 books in your Bible, we can't claim any promise out of that to ourselves. So we just throw it out. You can't gain a blessing out of all the other 66 books. That's why it is very important to understand when you see these people emphasizing dispensationalism and Paul, 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 it makes you wonder why they keep limiting to only to the books of the 12 epistles of Paul. Why don't they use a lot of other verses in the Bible? You know why? See that? Because they only think only those 12 books. And you might as well cut off, what, three quarters of your Bible? But the, what is this approach right here from Antioch? It's the whole word of God. Every word of God is pure. Taking every verse literally. We're going to take this. See that? By the way, what are you going to do with Old Testament uh, verses and even the other New Testament books that are not Pauline? that has similar doctrine like Christians, what are you going to do with that? You're going to cut that off? You're going to rob Christians of a blessing from that? Paul mentioned in Romans 15, the, what was written aforetime was written for our learning. Paul said, 1 Timothy 3.16, all scripture Amen. is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable not just for doctrine, but for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness. See, these mid-acts, they keep going in a doctrinal approach, doctrinal approach. You see the commonality with these two people? It's a scholastic mindset. Yep. Sitting at home doing nothing. Yeah, it's dead. The Bible-believing movement and IFB, there's one thing you cannot deny. They were always soul winners. Right. They were always evangelistic in form. These two movements have always caused hurt. You know what's going on with the Calvinists? Now they're catching up. Uh -huh. Oh, it took you this long now, huh? But we've been doing it for a long time, friend. You Calvinists were doing nothing but sitting at home, man. Now the mid-acts, I don't know what they're going to do. I guess they're going to sit down and do nothing. But I'm pretty sure they're going to start soul winning too because we keep, keep kicking them just like we did on the Calvinists. That's what's going to eventually happen, I'm sure. But mid-acts, how you know who, who are the Calvinists, who are the mid-acts? Here's the key words that you want to keep in mind. 
And that way you can avoid these videos and these channels and these churches. The key words are Presbyterian. That's Calvinist. When they mention sovereignty of God, this is not spell right. <laughs> I'll just go like this. When they mention elect, when they mention predestination, how do I find this, Pastor? All you have to do is go to their website. Go to their website and look at what we believe. That's all you have to do. Look at what we believe and look at these terms. How can you tell mid-Acts? Truly middle of Acts, that's what they teach. So in the middle of the book of Acts, that's when the church started. That's how you know they're hyper-dispensational. They're mid-Acts. The term that you will hear from mid-Acts is the term itself, mid-Acts, when they say that. When you hear mid-Acts, then you know, oh, sorry. When you hear the term grace, they put their, they use a lot of word on grace, church, grace, church, grace, church. When they use Berean, Berean is also the name of their organization sometimes. Another one is when they use, oh, there was an, uh, Paul. Yeah, our Apostle Paul. Remember that. If you hear them saying that quite often, that's like a red flag. <laughs> our Apostle Paul. Our, our, our Apostle Paul. That shows, see how much they're, that shows, see how much they're only focusing on Paul and getting rid of all the other stuff. Our problem with mid-Acts is not when the church started in the middle of Acts, actually. Our problem with them is that they have a tendency to hyper-divide more and more and more. That's why we're against them teaching about the church starting at the middle of Acts. Because they have a hyper-dividing -div tendency where they rob Christians of a blessing and promises of more verses. And Satan would love it where you don't go by every word of God, see? That's what he wants in your life. And you know what? Mid-Acts, they'll deny it. They'll say they don't mean to. But all you have to do is by their fruits, he shall know them. Look at the tendency and the walk and your practice in your life, and you'll see that. Now, how do I get all this history? By their fruits, he shall know them. It's not just the historical sources I pointed out, but just looking at their fruits. Now, if you deny this, if you think that I'm a heretic for teaching this, all you have to do is this. Look at our Calvinism playlist. That's all you have to do. Look at our Calvinism playlist and our dispensationalism play playlist. Look at our dispensationalism playlist and our Calvinism playlist, and then you can see whether the scriptures are right concerning these two doctrines or not. You can call me biased and opinionated out of all of this stuff, but all you have to do, why don't you have the guts to study the scriptures for yourself and prove me wrong and look at those two videos.